Hello there, so this is going to be another compilation of book reviews, however, I don't really have enough books together right now to really do a compilation video, so what I'm going to do is every time I run across a book that I have only brief thoughts on, that I just don't have that much to say, then I will just add it on here. So as of the time of this recording, I only have one, it's, it's Angel Fall, we'll get to it in a sec, but uh, after this, I'm just gonna keep adding more on until I get something that is of a reasonable length, I think, and we'll just see how that works out. Hopefully I'll have less stupid hair that day. But uh, first up is going to be Angel Fall by Susan E, I think. It might be like Susan A or something. I'm, I'm sorry, I have no clue how to say that. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. I'll say right now, this book is actually really great. I actually really like this. I heard about it and it sounded kind of neat, but I was not expecting it to be this good. So basically what it is, is there's this teenage girl named Penryn, who is with her si her younger sister Paige and their mother, who is a paranoid schizophrenic, and suddenly one day angels come down from heaven and they start attacking the earth, and uh, the story starts a couple of weeks after that, when most of the world's already destroyed and most people are already dead, and they're just trying to make their way in the apocalypse, and then Paige, or not Paige, uh, Penryn comes across an angel who is being attacked by other angels, and they actually cut his wings off, and while this is going on, uh, Paige gets kidnapped by angels and carried off somewhere else, and she has no idea where, so Penryn teams up with the angel whose wings got cut off, his name is Rafai, and they just agree to work together so that they can reach the area where her sister's being held, and hopefully try to rescue her. So this book has a really solid opening. It opens up and we get to the part where Paige is taken in like less than 20 pages, but while all that's going on we still manage to get a really good view of like what this world is like, what the characters are like, uh, what kind of shit they've been going through lately, which is pretty great. And then in the middle, I will admit it dips a bit. Like it's, it's not bad at any point or super boring I don't think, but it does dip in quality. And then by the time you get to the climax, it is one of the most insane things I've read in a long time. It is a phenomenal climax. Like, I, I don't want to hype you up too much, but it is really good. There's some crazy twists that happen in there. The action that goes down is really good. Uh, there's, j It's nuts, man. And I really liked it, and so for that reason, on Goodreads, I was like, you know what, fuck it. Five stars. That seems fair. You can see here that the book isn't that long, it's like less than 300 pages, and it does have a really quick pace, so even those parts in the middle where it does dip a little, they never last that long. You know, if there's a part that bores you, it probably won't go on for more than another 10, 15 pages maybe. It, like, sometimes the quick pace is a little detrimental, but honestly, for the most part it works really well. Like, this was a very easy thing to get through, and I was happy about that. Uh, but if you are ever reading this and you get to a point and you're like, yeah, this isn't very good, like, just power through it, it won't last that long. I really like the fight scenes and the action scenes in this too, because they're not 100% realistic, but they're a lot more realistic than some other stuff that I read. Because, one, Penryn has reasons for being so well trained in martial arts. Like, it's mentioned, I'm not gonna go too deep into it, but it is actually a really neat reason why her mom wanted her to be so good at self-defense. It's a ver very interesting, something I haven't really seen before, but uh, Penryn has spent years and years training very hard with in a variety of martial arts, so it makes sense that she would know what she's doing, but at the same time, she's not like a perfect fighter. You know, she's very good, but she can still make mistakes, and she's also still a small teenage girl. She's only like 16 or 17, and they actually don't um, give a whole lot of description about a lot of things in this book, which is part of why it's so short and so quick paced, but like, I don't know much about what Penryn looks like even after reading this. But anyways, uh, she's very small, and so if she runs into someone who also is a very good fighter but happens to be six foot five and weighs over 200 pounds, then she's in trouble unless she can come up with some other type of advantage. And I really like reading about that type of stuff. You know, it's basically a weak but skilled person versus a big hulking enemy. It's it's fun, and I, I like that sort of thing. I do wish that she was a bit better when fighting angels, but yeah, that's not a huge part of this book, and maybe in the other ones it'll get better. And 
the only real thing that I have to complain about here, other than, you know, some of the descriptions just not being very good, some of the lines are pretty stupid. Like, uh, this one, where they're just finding the bodies of two dead girls, and it says, one girl looks to be about Paige's age, and the other a couple of years older. That would make them seven and nine. Like, that... That, that genuinely feels like something I would read on Wattpad. Like, you know, you, we had all the information already, you don't need to throw more in there. Uh, and there's a couple of lines like that spread throughout, or a couple of lines where it kind of does the opposite, where it doesn't give us enough, or a couple of lines where it goes, I saw something crazy, and then describes what the crazy thing was. Which wouldn't bother me if it was once or twice, but it happens a lot, and it just gets kind of repetitive. So, I think this is the author's first book, which, for a first novel, this is really great, don't get me wrong, but it uh, needed one more pass-through where editors catch stuff like that. But overall, Angel Fall, really, really solid book. I, I want to read the second one as soon as I can, and if the idea of angels coming down and destroying the Earth appeals to you at all, you'll probably like this book. If you're thinking, oh no, that sounds maybe kind of neat, you'll probably like this. You, you may not, I don't know. Uh, if, if the idea doesn't appeal to you, you're, you're not going to enjoy this. But honestly, I really like the, this concept because we don't know exactly why the angels are coming down at first. <laughs> I don't know, maybe, maybe God's just pissed because we let gay people kiss or something. I don't know. But the point is, really great book. If it appeals to you at all, check it out. You'll probably like it. On to the next one, which will probably be filmed, I don't know when, but not, not right now. Okay, so now it's time for part two. And for this one, I have two quick reviews that I want to go over. So the first one is actually not even for a book, it's for a manga series called Gamaron. Now, I haven't talked about manga all that much on this channel, or about comic books for that matter, even though I am a fan of both of those. Not, not quite as much nowadays as when I was younger, but there's still lots of series out there that I've read and loved and that are completed that I think more people should know about, and Gamaron is definitely one of those. So the plot to this one is, like, really, really simple. Like, almost stupidly simple. Basically, uh, it takes place during the Edo period in Japan, and there is a daimyo, which is a feudal lord, who rules over, you know, this area, and he wants to know who the best martial arts school is in that area. And by martial arts, I mean, like, weapons, bare hands, all, all that sort of stuff. And so he gets his 31 sons together, and he tells them, okay, each of you needs to go out, pick one of those schools, and then they're all going to enter a tournament and fight each other, and whoever the victor is, uh, that guy gets to become the daimyo after me. And so then we go to the main character, or actually not even the main character, but uh, one of his sons named Naoyoshi, who goes to find this legendary swordsman, and so he goes to the sword school, and there's no one there except for this one kid, who turns out is the guy he was looking for's son, and his name is Gama, who is the real main character, and they talk a little bit, he sees that Gama is also a phenomenal swordsman in his own right, and so they agree to help each other out, and from there the whole series is basically just a bunch of action scenes, one right after the other. That's not a criticism, mind you, I think that's actually a very good thing, because the action is really the draw for this series. You know, we're here to watch Gama and other people. It's, it's not too big of a spoiler to say that other members of his sword school do show up later, it just takes some time. But we're here to watch them fight other dudes, and th this series knows how to pace things. Like, whenever there's a fight, there's also a little bit of downtime afterwards. Then there's a big long fight, and then there's some downtime afterwards. And they also know how to mix them up so that they're not all the same, because a problem that a lot of people have with uh, shonen battle manga is that a lot of the fights just boil down to, I can make bigger energy beams than you can, and then the bad guy's like, no, and then he disintegrates or whatever. This is not like that, because one, it's mostly pretty realistic. Like, you, you don't have people using magical powers or anything. It's mostly just, like, bare hands and real-life weaponry. Uh, yeah, that's not to say it's 100% realistic, because it it isn't, like, it's still a bit over the top and more than humans could do, but I think it keeps itself grounded enough that you could almost believe that most of this is possible, which is great, but even beyond that, most of the fights are not solved through brute force. Like, some of the smaller ones are, yes, but the 
bigger ones, like the ones that are more important to the storyline and everything, those are extremely tactical, extremely strategic. It re revolves around both the heroes and the villains uh, utilizing their own unique strengths and trying to analyze their opponents and find out their weaknesses. And then they come to, and eventually they come together and they manage to win like that. And it's fascinating to watch because, like I said, every fight is a little bit different, you know? Uh, watching Gama, who fights with a sword, try and fight somebody who has just a giant-ass spear, he's thinking, okay, that guy has a lot more reach than I do, but at the same time, if I can get past him, then, then he isn't able to switch and attack me at close range very easily, so how can I utilize that to my advantage? And that's different than somebody who has, like, a bigger sword than Gama trying to fight some guy who is fighting with his bare hands, but he's really agile and can uh, avoid most of his swings, and if he gets in close, then you're just dead. So, you, you know, there's a lot of strategy, a lot of tactics to it, and it makes it way more fun to read than just, I'm the good guy, and I win through the power of friendship. Now, the story does have one or two twists in there, like, part, it's not just, here's round one of the tournament, here's round two of the tournament, here's round three, until you get to the end. Like, there, there are some changes to the status quo uh, partway through the series, which I won't get too into. And, yeah, again, the story still isn't super complicated, but we do at least get a proper villain, and the characters are working towards a bit more of a complicated goal than just winning this tournament. So, it, it's, a, it's a good decision. And overall, this series, it knows exactly what it wants to be. You know, it's... It's not trying to be complicated. It's not trying to be a super deep character study or anything like that. It's just about all these cool action scenes, and it does those extremely well. The only problems I have with this are pretty minor, honestly, but Gama and Naoyoshi develop a really deep friendship through the series, which is great, but it comes across as homoerotic at times. Like, I don't think that was the intention. If it was the intention, then sure, that's fine. It's just trying to imply that they have romantic feelings towards each other. But it, it's, it feels more like Frodo and Sam in the Lord of the Rings movies, where they, they were clearly just trying to show that they're the best of friends, but it just comes across as them being kind of gay together sometimes. And so that was a little weird. Sam. I'm glad you're with me. Another problem is that the villain is pretty weak. Like, w once we get to the main villain, like, it, he... Th they do show off how powerful he is as a fighter. And that that's pretty cool, because, like, it builds up towards the last confrontation, and you're thinking, oh, how are the good guys ever going to defeat this guy? And even though it's a series filled with super badass martial artists, uh, and the heroes constantly have to, okay, let's let's get past this guy, um, it still manages to make him seem like a threat, but he's just a very weak character. You know, there's there's very little to him other than, I want power. Why do you want power? Because I want power. So he's pretty weak. Now, this one is not a problem for me, but I've heard people complain about it some places, which is weird to me because to me this makes it an even better series, but some people have complained that Gama is not really the most powerful person in the story. And what I mean by that is that in most of these shonen ba battle manga type stories, the main character, even if he's not the most powerful, godliest person in the series at the beginning, he will be by the end. Whereas in this, Gama, at the beginning, is a phenomenal swordsman, but the most powerful people in the series are way beyond him. And he does training and stuff and gets a lot better. And by the end, Gama is an even more phenomenal swordsman, but the top people at the top... Are, they're still way beyond him. You know, he still has many years of training left to go. And honestly, I I don't know, that was better to me because it made it seem like it was a bigger story than just about this one guy. It was about a group of people, but I don't know, that bothered some people, so I figured I should mention it. And then this one might just be a translation error, but there's someone who Gama wants to kill uh, because he killed a bunch of his friends in the past before the story begins, and so Part of the reason that Gama is going out there uh, with Naoyoshi is to try and find this guy. And he, he, throughout the whole series, he repeatedly says that he wants to kill him, but he never uses the words, I'm going to kill him. He always says, I'm going to cut him down, which may have just been the, the translation I read, 
but that feels like a very deliberate choice, and maybe it was like that in Japanese too, so I'm just, I'm just not sure why. It was very odd, and it comes up a lot throughout the series, so it just, it just bothered me. And uh, the one last thing that I have to complain about is that the ending to the series is a bit rushed. Now, basically what happened is that the series was already close to wrapping up, like it was in the midst of the climax, and we were uh, about to start the confrontation with the big bad guy, and there were still a bunch of fights that had to happen to, before we wrapped things up. Uh, but then the author heard, okay, hey, you gotta, you gotta end it now. You're, get, you're being canceled early. And so basically he had to condense about maybe 20 chapters worth of stuff into around five or six chapters, which is not ideal, but we did get an ending. You know, it's not like it just ends and we never find out what happens. It's not like uh, he was only halfway through where he wanted to be and he had to try and wrap things up like that. Like, we were already pretty close to the end. It's kind of like, uh, if you ever read Bleach, it, it was kind of like that. You know, they were about to confront the big bad guy for the final fight, and then the author was told, okay, you gotta end now, wrap it up. And so things were super rushed at the end, but we did get an ending and it could have been a lot worse. And overall, Gamaron, it knows exactly what it wants to be. It's a very fun series. So if you are someone who is into shonen battle manga, check it out. If you're someone who used to be into it, but now you think it's like a little too juvenile or something, maybe check this one out because it's a little bit smarter, knows what it's trying to be. If you're someone who is into like martial arts stuff and kung fu movies and that sort of thing, and you don't mind if it's a little bit over the top, but still somewhat realistic, then you'd probably really like this one if for no other reason than the tactical action stuff is a lot of fun. People keep asking me to talk about The Sword of Truth, so I'm going to do that real quick. Now, I read this book about 10 years ago. I was around 13 or 14 years old, and um, I didn't like it very much then. It, it's a very bad book. I, I Hate is a very strong word, but it's, it's terrible. Like, it is horribly put together. It's basically just an epic fantasy, and, and that's it. Like, if, if you... Whatever comes to your mind when you think epic fantasy is what comes up here. You know, there's a farm boy who is kind of sort of the chosen one who goes off on a quest with the help of a wizard and a really pretty girl who's into him for no reason to defeat some sort of dark lord. And then it's also filled with Randian objectivist philosophy. Now, the thing about this is there's basically no originality in this entire series, like none at all. And the story is just, well, I mean, it does exist. I'll give it that much. Like, the story, sometimes epic fantasy will fall into this trap of just, it'll start off and here's the inciting incident, and the bad guy is has his plan, the heroes have to go stop him, and then they walk through the woods for the majority of the book. They're just kind of going through the woods, doing stuff, nothing interesting happens, and then you reach the climax, and they fight the bad guy, and that's terrible. At least in Sword of Truth, there is other stuff that happens along the journey, so that's great. And I will say that the characters do have, they, they are characters. You know, they have personalities and goals and motivations and flaws. And I don't know, I think more books should try doing stuff like that. You know, I at least remember what these people are like, but still, it, uh, there's not a whole lot to them. Part of the reason I've never talked about Sword of Truth all that much is that th there's just not that much to say. It's, it's terrible, but it's terrible in a boring way. You know, something like The Fifth Sorceress which is way worse, is at least entertaining in how awful it is and kind of interesting to look at how awful it is and how it completely falls apart. This is just kind of dull. Like, the only parts that stand out are the parts where the main character is getting tortured by a dominatrix and it's very clear the author is just putting his fetishes out there, which, like, I'm not saying you can't do that. I'm just saying you have to be at least a little subtle about it and you can't spend a huge chunk of the book on it. You just, you can't. The Fifth Sorceress kind of did the same thing there, but like, that that's just, oof. And as I said, it's filled with Randian objectivist philosophy, which again, you can put your own beliefs in there if you're gonna try and uh, convince other people of it, but you gotta be smarter about it than this. This is just, well, I mean, it's like Ayn Rand, you know? She thinks, or she thought, she's dead now, thankfully, but she just thought that her ideas were so self-evidently correct that she never really bothered to argue for them, and instead she just put the story in a world where her ideas were correct and got everyone else to 
look at it and say, oh wow, how awesome this world is. I wish our world was more like this fake world and it got everyone to think that they were the main character. Or not everyone, but it got all the wrong people to think that they were the main character. They are all geniuses being held back by society. Yeah, and Sword of Truth is just filled with that kind of stuff. Or I should say Wizard's First Rule, actually, because Sword of Truth is the series and Wizard's First Rule is the book. But whatever, I only read the first book. Even when I was 14, it just felt like a crappy derivative knockoff of Lord of the Rings, which it is. And, well, there's, there's not that much, else, that much else to say about it. It's just a really crappy book. And maybe if I reread it today, I'd remember some other issues and stuff that I could talk about in more detail, but I really don't want to. Like, if you were to hold a gun to my head and ask me to either reread The Fifth Sorceress or reread Wizard's First Rule, I would reread The Fifth Sorceress because that's at least funny. All right, and this one is going to have to be the last one in this compilation, but I'm going to talk about Wanderers by Chuck Wendig. Now, this book, I remember hearing about it when it first came out, and I thought, wow, that actually sounds really interesting. That looks really neat. Uh, but I never got around to actually buying it or reading it because it's a really long book, and all the hardcovers that I found were super expensive. So I just I just left it and put it on my to-read list and left alone for a long time. Until, um, <clears throat> at some point last summer, I got the audiobook and I started listening through it. Now, it's a very long audiobook. It's over 30 hours long. I made it around two-thirds of the way through before I finally just threw up my hands and said, Fuck this. I'm not doing this anymore. This is awful, and I have to stop. Alright, this whole review is going to be full of spoilers up until the point I read, because while, it, again, it has been a while since I gave up on it, so I haven't... I don't really remember the character names, and I have forgotten a lot of some of the smaller plot bits. I remember a lot of the major ones, because it, they were really stupid, and I remember a lot of the major problems I had with it. So, if for whatever reason this appeals to you, I just just don't uh, watch past this point, because it's full of spoilers. Now, I know Chuck Wendig, I haven't read any of his other stuff, but I know he was one of the people... Uh, that was like writing Star Wars books for Disney and they weren't paying him properly and so it was, there was an outcry about it. I did not pay a whole lot of attention to that, unfortunately, so I can't speak on it. Maybe Chuck Wendig's other stuff is great. This book is terrible. So basically, the premise for this is that people one day just start randomly losing their minds, I suppose is one way of putting it. Like, they become completely unresponsive, they stop talking, eating, whatever, and then they all just leave their house and start walking in one direction, and people from all over the United States eventually converge and create this big, like, caravan and are just walking west towards something. They they don't know exactly what it is, and obviously this is all over the news, people are freaking out about it, wondering, well, what what is this? What the hell's happening? And most of the main characters in this book, because it's one of those ensembles that has a large cast of a bunch of people from disparate walks of life who all converge on this, uh, caravan, and most of them are people that are, like, escorting it, going, uh, with it to wherever it's going. And this is also, wh whatever disease or whatever is causing this is also extremely odd because the people's skin becomes hardened, so, like, they can't take any blood samples or anything, the, they don't seem to get hurt by the weather or anything that, uh, comes near them. They just, it, whatever it is, it's very odd, and so, we follow, you know, people escorting them, wondering what's going on. We follow a doctor, or an epidemiologist, I should say, who is trying to get to the bottom of it and figure out, like, okay, if this thing is contagious, then, like, how do we deal with that? Uh, and there's also a preacher who becomes almost like an Alex Jones-type guy uh, partway through the story and is spouting off conspiracies about, like, what's really going on, which is... And not as funny as you might think. Like, wh whatever your thoughts on Alex Jones, the dude is pretty funny, and they don't really take advantage of that because it's pr this is pretty clearly aping on him, and there's no humor there. Now, I'll give this book credit. That's an amazing start, and that's part of what kept me going with this story far longer than I normally would have, is that th that's a fantastic idea. And even when there's parts of the plot where there's not a whole lot happening, I was still really into it because... 
it's building suspense and it's building mystery and uh, I'm theorizing in my own head about, oh, okay, I wonder what caused it. Could it be that? I don't think so. Could it be that? And then we're also watching the characters investigate and try and gather up clues and stuff. And it's just really, really neat. And I loved it. Uh, around 40% eh, of the way through the book, it did start to grate on me, though. And then around halfway through the book, we find out the real reason uh, why all this is happening. And one last warning, if you want to read this, leave now, but the reason this is happening is that there is a fungal disease that got out, which is briefly mentioned at one point in the book and then just never touched on again until this point. Uh, and it's going to infect a bunch of people and kill uh, pretty much the whole human population. And there is a supercomputer that could somehow see into the future that predicted this before it happened, and so it created a bunch of nanomachines, and then those nanomachines went out and, like, basically hijacked the people who are the wanderers, you know, and was telling them to go to some safe place out somewhere, and the cloud of nanites was also protecting them from, you know, the elements and everything, and it, this was its plan to make sure that humanity survived. Okay, that may have worked if it had been built up to even kind of, sort of, a little bit, maybe. It did not. It hit me like a truck when it happened. And, I mean, in, in one sense, having a twist which you don't see coming is good, but the twist also has to be properly built up to and it has to make logical sense. Like, this just comes completely out of nowhere, and so I was thinking that it was kind of stupid and it didn't fit with this world, because the world that was has been created is basically just our world with this one crazy sci-fi event going on. And I stuck with the book for a little while after that, and the main plot was still not really happening, and around two-thirds of the way through, I was just like, you know what, uh, life is too short, and I stopped. So maybe the last third of the book is amazing, but I kind of doubt it. So part of the issue with a lot of ensemble cast books is that none of the characters are all that good because... Well, one, none of them really get all that much time to stand out, and two, the authors oftentimes only do that because they want to look cool and look unique and look like, look, I'm like Game of Thrones, we have a bunch of characters from a bunch of different perspectives and they're all contributing to the plot, but the characters are either pointless or they're more defined by what they do in the story than who they are as people, so most of them just aren't that interesting or that good in any way. Uh, the only one I remember that I kind of liked was this old aging rock star who had hit kind of a rut in his life and decided, you know what, I'm going to go out and do this. I think that I could be helping some people and putting some good back into the world, which I thought was kind of neat, but really nothing that special. And all of the political stuff in here is really not that good. Now, the thing is, science fiction has been used to put forth a lot of, like, social commentary and political ideas for decades, which I'm totally fine with. Um, and even, even if I don't necessarily agree with it, I think it's always neat to consider some of these ideas. But this is not done well at, at all. Like, not even kind of, sort of, a little bit. So, basically, there's, there's two ways that I think you can do this. You can either have it be really subtle or not, not too subtle, but have it be subtle to the point where, okay, yeah, pe people who agree or disagree will be a little bit more affected by it, or you can just be totally metaphorical with it, which is what sci-fi excels at, you know? You may not be able to talk about modern-day racism without people getting butthurt about it, but if you put it in space and talk about, like, aliens or something, then suddenly you can bring up some of these same ideas and put it forth and people will pay a little more attention to you, so that works. And th this book does neither of those things. It's like very in your face, it feels like I was being hit over the head with some of these ideas, and I don't even disagree with most of them. Like, I, I don't. Like, uh, a big theme in here is how misinformation is fueling a rise in fascism, which is very true, 100% true, but like, okay, your analysis of it is so surface level, and 
you're so unsubtle with it, you're basically just saying fascism is bad. I'm like, yes, I, I agree, but like, someone who thinks fascism is good isn't going to uh, be, have their mind changed by this. So that's Wanderers. Didn't like it very much. It was, it was stupid and terrible, and I could probably sit here for another 15 minutes and talk about like smaller moments that I thought were dumb, but honestly, like I said, life is too short. This review compilation has already gone on for a while, and I don't feel like talking anymore. Goodbye. Uh, uh, thanks to all all the names on here. Those are my patrons, and thanks to ten dollar and up, uh, Apo Savalane and Olivia Ray and Brother Santotis, Christopher Quinton, Embus, Joel, Karkat Kitsune, Liza Rudakova, Madison Lewis Bennett, Microphone, Paul Williams, Sad Mardigan, Tobacco Crow, Tom Beanie, and Ve Victus. You're all you're you're all really cool. All all the names on here. Uh, they 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 gave me money. Uh, and they get stuff like early access to videos and uh, voting on future video topics. You, um, if you want to be one, then do that. If you, if you don't want to do that, then um, join, join, join my channel. Become a channel member. That's great. Or, or um, just, you know, subscribe, like, video, comment. Um, uh, spread this around. I need help.